Getting Q3 started with a big move in this bond market. Yield to lower, equities just a little bit softer. From New York City, the countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue. Here come the downgrades. Economists have begun to cut their top-down economic forecasts for GDP. We're looking at an economy losing momentum faster than you know what we anticipated. Input costs have risen substantially. We've had the two biggest quarters of inventory build. We're seeing demand destruction in some areas. The consumer is on somewhat more fragile footing. We're starting to see this economy slow. We do expect the Fed to hike rates more aggressively. Companies and consumers need to get ready. Frankly, we think they can keep going. There's a change in the underlying economy. We did see some pretty notable down, downward revisions. We just don't see how how we don't get an, uh, a recalibration here. We expect more downgrades. We've seen some already. We expect more. We're getting clear signs of slowing. Brilliant lineup this morning, and we begin with Mohammed Al Arian of Bloomberg Opinion and Queen's College, Cambridge. Mohammed, I want to start with this question, and thank you for being with us. Is the economic pain we're starting to feel the market volatility we've witnessed through the year so far, is that a feature or a bug for this Fed? It's a, um, how do I put it? Um, it is an irritation, I suspect, for the Fed. Look, the Fed has been driving the car looking through the rearview mirror. So the Fed now is fully, unconditionally fighting inflation, but it's going to aggressively hike into a slowing economy. And that's the combination that the market is worried about. And what we're seeing playing out, John, virtually every day for the last few days is not just interest rate risk. That's become less of a concern. It's now about credit risk and liquidity risk. Or in other words, it's about an economic recession and it's about the difficulties companies will, may face in getting new capital. And we've seen this in the credit market, Mohammed. So let's talk about it. Investment grade spreads. 150. High yield spreads through 550, 570. We're seeing it with triple C spreads, as you might expect, 1,000 basis points. This is not late 2018 where the Fed could back away and they started to see these numbers. Mohammed, this is a different story, as you know, and we all know. I'm trying to work out whether there is a tipping point. Is there a tipping point in this credit market where you think the Fed looks around and says, maybe we need to rethink here? If there is, John, we're not anywhere near it. Um, the Fed now is focused on inflation, and that's the big difference with 2018. When you don't have inflation in the system, you can respond to what's happening in the credit market. When you have inflation in the system, it's much harder to respond. And I think the message was crystal clear from this week's um, remarks by central bankers. They worried about inflation getting entrenched, rightly so. So I think the notion that the Fed will blink early this time based on credit issues um, is, is not likely to happen. I do think, and you and I have discussed this, that we face the risk of a flip-flopping Fed in a few months when they realize that the economy has slowed, but inflation is still not under control. You wrote in the FT this week, not just a flip-flopping Fed, the risk of a multi-round flip-flopping Fed. Mohammed, walk me through that. What pushes the Fed to stop, start, stop, start, and create even more volatility and more problems? Lack of conviction and lack of a proper understanding of what the economy is doing, and therefore, lack of credibility. That is the history of the 70s and the 80s, where you end up having this flip-flopping phenomenon among central banks, and it's problematic because by the time you come out of it, you've solved neither for growth nor for inflation. And that's where you get whipsawed and markets get whipsawed. I can go through all the quotes from all the banks right now. They're cutting their growth forecast. Morgan Stanley, overnight, they've made a move for 2022. They now see U.S. GDP growth at 0.9 percent, fourth quarter, fourth quarter. They've previously seen 1.4. Goldman came out, Jan Hatzis and the team, lowering their GDP forecast, their tracking estimate, by one percentage point for Q2. 
to just 1.9 percent. Some people expecting something a whole lot worse. Nomura coming out, sounding the alarm, calling for a global contraction, saying the following. In addition to the U.S., we now expect recessions in the eurozone, U.K., Japan, South Korea, Australia, Canada, all of those places, all of those regions, countries in recession for all of them. Mike McKee, there's some big calls coming from some big banks in the last 24 hours. Yeah, and I can show you the reason why in one chart everybody is following the economy and it's hard to boil it down to one forecast. But if, if there is one everybody looks at, it's the Atlanta Fed GDP Now numbers. And they have now gone negative for the second quarter. They say we're looking at a 1% contraction. That would be the second contraction in a row uh, quarterly for the U.S. And you can see the blue line there. That's financial conditions. And that's one big difference between now and maybe the 70s, 80s is the markets know what the Fed's going to do. The markets are front running it. They didn't know in the 70s and 80s. Look how fast financial conditions have changed. And so that has led to forecast changes and this change, a change in the way people are looking at what the Fed is going to do next. We've already got rate cuts priced into our WIRP function. And take a look on the left-hand side there. That's the forecast for what they're going to do at the July 27th meeting. And it has come down. It was firmly at 75 basis points. Now it's moving down a little bit. Are people going to start discounting the possibility of maybe the uh, Fed going back a little bit. That will depend on what happens with some of the data next week, including Friday. Friday, the big day, of course, with jobs. And we are expecting a slowdown. 250,000 jobs is the consensus right now. We'll have to somehow get through the week without the ADP report because that's been placed on hiatus. It's that a bit of sarcasm there, Mike. Yeah, that's a Just bit a of sarcasm bit. there. But uh, we do have the ISM manufacturing numbers today. That'll play into it big. We'll look at what the employment numbers are in that. And the same thing with ISM services. And of course, everybody's going to be watching the Fed minutes next Wednesday. But it all culminates Friday with payrolls, and that may have a big effect on what people think is going to happen in the end of July when the Fed meets again. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Going into the long weekend. Shortened trading day as well for the bond market. But wow, are we seeing a move in this bond market? Down 15 basis points on twos, 280. On a five year, down 17 basis points, 286. On a 10 year, down 14, sub 290. Never mind sub three, 287. Mohammed, Come back in here on the bond market. Talk to me about it. Your view on this flip-flopping Fed and how you think the bond market is going to pick up on that story. So again, the bond market is leading the Fed. The bond market led the Fed on, on rate hikes. It took a long time for the Fed to recognize that there was an inflation problem that they needed to hike. And now the, the bond market once again is saying, whoa, wait, look at what's happening to the real economy. What I find really interesting, John, is that even though we've had this massive move in bond yields in the U.S., the dollar is stronger today. We are back at levels that we haven't seen since November of 2002. And what that tells you is that the market is even more worried about growth outside the U.S. than it is here, and that the U.S. is still viewed as a safe haven. So this is not just a U.S. story, but as you read out from some of the quotes, this is a global story. Mohammed, this feels like a new phase in this story of the market so far this year. It's not the same as what dominated the front half. It was pain in stocks, pain in bonds. Can you walk me through where you think this new phase in this market regime is going? Yeah, John, and, and you know, I've found very simple construct are really helpful. And the simple construct I've had is the sequential move from inflation stroke interest rate risk to credit risk to possibly liquidity risk. So the first, most of the first quarter was about inflation interest rate risk. And there, everything sells off unless you are a commodity and you have supply side issues. But that's why your 60-40 portfolio was so harmful. The minute interest rate risk is mostly priced in and credit risk comes, back, comes in, which is what has happened over the last few weeks, suddenly the correlations between bonds and stocks, the traditional correlations, when the price of one goes up, the price of the other one comes down, regains its footing. And investors have some risk mitigation, but then the impact is mainly on equities and on swap, on spreads. And the one risk I'm really worried about is liquidity risk. And we're starting to see markets locked out of funding and keep a very close eye. Issuance in June was very low. 
companies either were unwilling or unable to, refi to refinance themselves. So we need to look at issuance and make sure that that doesn't freeze up. I was going through some of those numbers on the issuance side, and it's pretty dreadful for high yield. It's pretty dreadful for other parts of the market as well. When you talk about liquidity, Mohammed, can you just put a bit more detail on that, some more colour? Are you expecting liquidity problems to be where you'd expect traditionally for there to be liquidity problems or liquidity problems to turn up in places where there should be liquidity? So, you know, on my radar screens are three sets of potential, I want to stress potential, liquidity strain. One is in peripheral markets that somehow contaminate the main markets. So far, crypto hasn't. So far, EM hasn't, but keep an eye on that. The second type of risk is simply the inability to raise funding at any cost. And again, we've seen high yield go through this, but high yield is less important than if we, it migrates up the quality ladder. And then the final one, John, which I'm surprised people aren't talking about, we would have expected major rebalancing flows by now to help equities. And we haven't seen that. So is it that they're being offset by outflows? Or is it that investors are less willing to rebalance in favor of risk asset? We don't know, but it is notable that we haven't seen the sort of rebalancing effects that you would expect after a quarter like we've seen in the second quarter. What a quarter it's been. What a first half it's been as well. Mohammed, awesome. As always, a clinic from you. Mohammed. Al Arian from Gramercy and, of course, Queen's College, Cambridge, and Bloomberg Opinion too. Mohammed, we appreciate your time, sir, as always. Just brought up those issuance numbers on the junk bond side of things. New bond sales, a modest 9.7 billion, the slowest June since 2010 for junk issuance. The first half supply, the slowest since 2009. Just something to think about. Coming up, equity strategists seeing further downside after the worst first half since 1970. We need to see the market getting much more comfortable with earnings expectation before you get maybe a more tradable uh, bottom. But that's not where we are now. That conversation up next. If you look at high yield, typically it, it peaks at about 10% in the cycle. Right now it's high eights. So I would say that's 10-ish, maybe somewhere around there, but nowhere near current levels. The Fed's looking right now at the tightening conditions and saying, yeah, it hurts. Yeah, it's painful, but this is a feature. It's not a bug. This is a feature. It's not a bug. The quote of the week from Mike Schumacher of Wells Fargo, and one of the reasons that Goldman is defensive over the next three months, but more optimistic, constructive over the next 12. Goldman's Christian Muller Glissman writes in the following We remain relatively defensive for three months. We look for opportunities to add risk for 12 months. While the likelihood of a recession has increased, we wouldn't expect it to be deep or prolonged. TD's Priya Misra, Luke Carr of UBS, joins us right now. Priya, I want to go straight to your call on short two year treasuries targeting 340 on a two-year on a morning where we've got a monster bit at the front end of the curve, down 14 basis points to 280. Help me understand your position right now, Priya. Sure. So we've had this monster bid for the last week. You know, it, it sort of accelerated the last couple of days. I will say that the market's less liquid. So small amount of flow is having an exaggerated reaction. So I think we shouldn't get too caught up on the daily moves. But overall, I think the market is a little more relaxed about inflation. I'm not sure why, because we've seen very persistently high inflation numbers, which we expect is going to remain with us for a while. And the market's expecting the Fed to respond and not hike as much. And that's why we've actually seen even July July meeting odds go from 75 basis points, which was priced in two weeks ago, to now 65 and beyond. The end point of the hiking cycles declined significantly. I think there's a couple of issues. I think the economy is slowing and the Fed is saying that's collateral damage. I mean, as you said, feature. It is a feature of tightening policy. I don't think they respond and they're looking at inflation. And what they're telling us is as an unconditional commitment to put that inflation genie back in the bottle. Inflation expectations, headline inflation, you know, not just PCE. And therefore, I think if inflation stays high, which is our view, and growth remains 
okay. I mean, we're looking for 350 on payrolls next week, which is a strong number. Unemployment rate remaining unchanged. The market will have to reprice that Fed hiking cycle. I mean, we can be really worried about growth end of next year, but I think for the next six months, it's still the inflation problem that the Fed has to deal with, and I don't think they blink. The market's pricing in that Fed blinking in the next few months, and I think it's it's premature for that. Priya, you're looking for four percent on Fed funds beforehand, or Luke Cowart? Does any of that resonate with you? Well, one thing that does definitely resonate with us is that you know, high inflation means slower growth going forward. And that's, you know, that's, I think, one of our themes continuing for not just the next three to six months, but uh, but also beyond that. And I think where some of the focus is maybe uh, a little different from Prius, we've been focusing a little more just on the long end of the curve and getting more constructed there. And the, the thought has basically been since, you know, since the latest FOMC meeting, that seems to be when you know the the dam has burst, so to speak, in that we were always thinking, okay, when do you price in enough tightening so that you really start to get cuts in the back end priced in in a way that provides a little more support in the long end? Uh, that's one thing that's changed in a big way. So, for example, you know, after the May meeting and then the run up to the June meeting, you had anywhere from from 20 to 40 basis points of cuts from the end of 2022 through the start of 2024 priced in. And now we're at over 80 there. So the market is effectively pricing in, not the Fed blinking as, as soon as Priya suggests, I, I think, but definitely doing enough damage to the economy that they're forced to reverse course. And that's something that uh, puts a bit of a better floor under the long end is, is something that we've been, we've been thinking of lately. So bonds are back, Luke, for you and the team, potentially at the long end, tens, maybe longer than that. Can you help me understand the equity side of the position for you too? Are you less constructive there as you get more constructive on the bond side? Yeah, certainly on the on the equity side, I think the you know cheap praise, but stocks have uh, you know gone uh, stocks have gone down, stocks have sold off, but stocks are not on sale. It's uh, it's still just the fact that if you're looking at them relative to bonds uh, on a cross asset basis, stocks just still not are not that attractive to buy. And then you have to consider. OK, what should uh, quote unquote valuations be in this growth backdrop? Well, we have a growth backdrop where the Fed is telling you they want slower growth. Uh, Europe certainly isn't prioritizing growth for, for geopolitical reasons right now. And, and China, although we, we believe there the, the situation has improved and, uh, you know, there's a bit of a better balance between growth and public health outcomes, public health outcomes still come first. So in the U.S., Europe and China, growth is not a priority. How can equity investors think that, uh, you know, growth has Estimates and earnings estimates are going to hold up that well in an environment where three kind of major pillars of the global economy are telling you that that's not really at the top of their list right now. So to our view, it's it's that the right now the the level of equity risk premium aren't justifying uh, the kind of likely downside risk to earnings from here, and that's something that you know as we expect, whether it's you know this earnings season or in the run up to it, that you might start to see just those headline EPS estimates start to roll over because normally in any kind of downturn of this magnitude, it uh, it doesn't end before you at least get some trimming to EPS estimates. Certainly, we won't be we won't be waiting for EPS estimates to completely bottom, but we would like to see kind of the analyst community just get more on board. And I think uh, one thing you've seen in recent earnings announcements is that uh, you know this EPS downside is not yet priced in. That's yep. why the stocks are having significant reactions. We've heard a ton of that on this program over the last couple of weeks, particularly from Lisa Shadow and Morgan Stanley. We'll catch up with Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley in about 20 minutes' time. Priya, with the economic backdrop that Luke just described, that doesn't sound like a world where inflation expectations can remain elevated. You'd expect them to get hammered. Why do you think you should still own tips in the world that Luke just described? Sure. So I think long and inflation expectations can decline and they have been declining. Where I struggle with is the very front end. You know, I know oil prices have fallen, some commodity prices have fallen, but you look at gasoline, you look at what's impacting U.S. consumers, those numbers are still high. Food prices are high. Shelter, I mean, shelter is a lagging indicator of home prices. Home prices were up 20% the last two years. So we think rent inflation will continue to rise. With mortgage rates rising, it's a little bit perverse, but actually more people might rent than buy. So when I look at CPI forecasts for the rest of the year into early next year, we have very high CPI estimates. And so the very front end of the tips market is attractive. For anyone that is owning risk assets, I would say own some tips break evens because the biggest risk to your portfolio is that inflation comes in high. The Fed is committed. They just told us they are unconditionally committed. They're going to keep hiking 
creating a more negative backdrop for the economy, for your assets a year from now, the only hedge really are front-end inflation-protected securities because those just get a lot of carry when when inflation numbers are high. So it's much more a near-term, like one-year, two-year tips is what I would own, just to position for inflation that's not as volatile. And it's been very hard to predict, and it has come in persistently higher than anyone's been forecasting Fed, uh, you know, uh, sell-side economists, I think there's still more room in that inflation trade to keep running. Priya, in what way does a short and a two-year and a long in tips complement each other? Because I would have thought that if you believe we get to 4% on Fed funds and your short two is up to 340, then in that world, inflation expectations just get hammered. And so does inflation protection. Why do tips work no, and the short twos point. work? How does that work? Fair point. I think that's in the long end. The issue is the Fed, I know, is focused on inflation, headline inflation. They don't have a whole lot of control on many parts of inflation, whether it's shelter, whether it's um, food, energy. And so I think they can raise rates a lot, but does it really impact inflation in the near term? The other issue is monetary policy lags. And this has been my issue with the Fed reaction function, but they're responding to realized inflation which is not going to respond to policy right now. And so I think until they become model driven or outlook driven, I think they're going to run the risk of driving, looking at the rear view mirror because they're looking at inflation that's actually responding to growth and monetary policy a year ago. So the lags, the fact that Fed policy actually doesn't affect large parts of inflation and it affects with a big lag. It first has to slow growth down, then that affects inflation, is how you can have both components. The Fed keeps going, inflation stays high. They're actually fairly consistent. And I would agree with Luke, I think owning long end is attractive because you know, for all the talk of recession, the yeah. market's pricing in cuts only up to two and a half. If we have a recession in the US next year, the Fed doesn't stop at two and a half. They're going well through that. So I actually think the long end has room to rally if the economy does slow down more than we're looking for, like a recession next year. I think that long end has a lot more room to go. So a flattening of the, of the yield curve, inversion of the yield curve is what I would call it. Priya, the world that you describe for equity investors sounds horrifying. Fed funds at four and inflation persisting. What a call. Priya Misra, a TD, thank you. Luke Cower of UBS, the him and the team, thank you very much. Up next, the morning calls and later, Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley. Equity futures negative two tenths of one percent. Here are your morning calls. First up, Berenberg downgrading FedEx to hold, waiting for the macroeconomic outlook to improve. Bank of America downgrading Micron to neutral, highlighting signs of weakening demand. And finally, JP Morgan reiterating its overweight on Apple, expecting better supply dynamics to overwhelm a modest decline in demand. Up next, one of the best on the street is Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley on the equity market pain of the first half of 22. And what's in store for the second half? You're opening bell. This Friday morning, up next. Let's get the final trading day of the week started. The first day of Q3 started so you can get to your long weekend stateside. Futures negative two tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down by four tenths of one percent. On the Russell, futures negative two tenths of one percent following the worst first half since 1970 on the S&P. Here's your second half. That's your opening bounce. Switch up the board. Your bond market looks like this. There's a big bid this morning. Yields are lower by 13 basis points on a 10-year. You thought sub-3% was new. Try sub 290, 288.76. We're down 12 or 13 basis points right now. Euro dollar negative eight tenths of 1%, even with an inflation surprise, an upside positive surprise. Call it negative, call it what you will. We are higher on inflation in Europe, 8.6%, and the euro is clinging to 104. Dollar strength is a story this morning. Yields lower, dollar strength. It speaks to concerns about global growth. But look at crude. It doesn't speak to that at all, up 2.6%. This is the course the cause of some of these issues, 108.50 on WTI. There's a story around the open about 40 seconds in. Let's strip this back and get you some movers and get to the West Coast and catch up with Ed. Morning, Ed.
Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. Zeroed in on Micron forecasting weaker than expected sales in the quarter. The maker of DRAM or memory chips really focus on this because it's kind of a barometer of consumer demand. The concern being that demand for smartphones, PCs slowing down. That stock down 2.8% at the open. Apple interesting up two tenths of 1%. There was concern that the read through from Micron was that demand was waning. But as you said, John, there's also an improving supply picture, which the street is hoping will outweigh its supply crunch concerns. Coles, wow, look at that, down 18 0.2%. Coles board walking away from a deal to sell the company for $8 billion to Franchise Group. They basically said Franchise's group offer reflects the current retail and financing environment, but it would not be prudent to proceed with the given market volatility that we're seeing. So that stock down big. And Delta Airlines, just one airline that we're looking at in particular amid many that are rising up 1%. A report that American Airlines has offered its pilots a 17% pay boost for contracts. John, a report out overnight. Interesting ahead of the long weekend because I think we're all hoping there are enough pilots to get us from A to B. We're catching up with Kriti Gupta a little bit later. She's at LaGuardia. Good. She's going to talk about those airlines in just a moment. Ed, just quickly, GM, yeah. your thoughts on what yeah. took place about 30 minutes ago. Initially, when it was halted, news pending, you're expecting something big. I'm not sure we got something big. What did we get? Yeah, mixed picture. Two pieces of news, really. Basically, a second quarter profit warning below consensus on net income. But what they said was really interesting on the semiconductor size. They have 95,000 vehicles in inventory that they're not able to shift or sell because they're missing chips, essentially. Now, they did reaffirm full year guidance, which is important. They're basically saying even though they can't sell those 95K vehicles right now, they'll catch up at the end of the year. But what a contrast, John, with Micron, right? Different pockets of the chip sector that have different levels of tightness. Ed, thank you, sir, as always. About two minutes into this, we're negative two-tenths of one percent. Energy top of the pile up, nine-tenths of one percent on energy equities off the back of the rally you see in the commodity market at the moment. Try and find financials for you. Near the bottom of the pile, down a third of one percent. The banks aren't going to enjoy what's happening in this bond market right now, that's for sure. Although the banks haven't enjoyed anything that's happened in this bond market for the year so far, and yields have been rocketed higher. For retail, there is a problem. And it's easier to see. PIMCO's Aaron Brown weighing in earlier this week. What inflation keeps ticking higher on are those necessities. And that's ultimately what's going to, you know, create a, a shallow consumer recession. We're already, I think, in an Amazon recession right now. We've already seen retail goods, um, durable goods spending start to roll over. And I think that that's, you know, an early canary in the coal mine for what's to come, you know, in the broader economy. We're in an Amazon recession right now. Her view. Katie Greifau joins us now for more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, like Aaron Brown said, I mean, if you're spending more on necessities, you don't have much left for the discretionary spends. And that what we saw play out in the first half in the consumer discretionary sector, losing one fourth of its value in the second quarter alone. You had just three of 58 stocks in that index in the green Dollar Tree, Dollar General and AutoZone. That says something. And the loss is there in that sector. Big reason why the S&P 500 shed nearly nine trillion dollars in market cap in the first half. If you break that into sectors, of course, tech had the most to lose, shaving about $3.3 trillion. Up next, though, are those discretionary stocks, that sector losing almost $2 trillion in value. And, John, as you know well, this is all about inflation. You have costs on everything going up, especially the essentials, home, shelter, energy, airfare, all soaring in cost. Again, John, not a lot of budget left for those discretionary spends. Katie, what a year it's been so far. You've got six months more months of it. Can't Kate wait. Thank you. That's my pitch for the rest of the year, I know. Let's hope it gets better. What a year it's been so far. We're trying to turn the page on a messy first half. This is a point of great uncertainty. Uncertainty. Big uncertainties. Uncertainty around inflation. Some significant changes since the pandemic. Transition point in the market. How far rates are going to have to rise. The Fed acted way too late. For the second half of the year. The big question now we have is on growth. The question is now on earnings. Margins must come down. The market will have to fall further. Volatility is likely to persist. We don't see the uncertainty in the other markets going away. We need a different strategy. We we still have a long road ahead. New half, same uncertainty. Morgan Stanley expecting equity declines to continue, writing the following. Falling yields and lower oil prices have lowered the terminal rate for the Fed. Last week, the market took the bullish view, which may last a few more weeks before the reality of lower earnings arrives and the bear market resumed. I'm pleased to say a good friend of this program joins us right now. It's Mike Wilson of Morgan Stanley. And what a year you're having, Mike. Let's start right there. You wrote it going into last weekend, a lower yield, bullish or bearish, yields are lower today, talk to me. 
Hey, John, it's always good to be with you. Happy Fourth of July weekend. Um, maybe a little extra day of break here from uh, from the volatility. But look, I mean, I think it is playing out uh, very much as we expected this year with the with the fire and ice combination. And the first half, though, is all about the fire, right? It's all about inflation. Um, it's all about the Fed catching up uh, to where they need to be to you know slow things down. And of course, now the second half is going to be about the slowdown. And so, you know, rates moving lower is not about the Fed pausing or giving up on their, you know, battle against inflation. It's about the Fed winning that battle, quite frankly, and slowing growth in a way which now is going to affect earnings. And that's going to be the story of the second half. So the first half was terrible for everything because, you know, when financial conditions are tightening that rapidly, all risk assets trade off. Even commodities have had a tough go here lately. But in the second half of the year, we expect that you know bonds will be actually a safe haven because they do well when growth is slowing, and of course stocks will suffer. So we're just not done with this bear market. Um, you know the good news is we've been in for probably over close to a year uh, for for a lot of stocks. Uh, it's well advanced, but we we just haven't had the concluding chapter yet. Mike, we've heard from some bulls out there on the equity market. I'm sure you've seen their research too. Marko Kalanovic at JP Morgan thinks that we can recover the first half losses in the second half in many places in this market. Jonathan Golub at Credit Suisse is really constructive. He's looking for a double-digit return year-end. Take a listen to what he had to say. What we've seen so far this year, profits are up 7.5% year-to-date, and they'll probably be up another 5 to 6% between now and the end of, of the year. So we don't have a profit problem as much as people say. We think that the earnings continue to move forward, and we think that you get a bounce in valuation, probably a couple of multiple points between now and the end of the year. Mike, I hear this a lot. You hear this a lot. What are they getting wrong? <laughs> well, look, I mean, I could be wrong. You know, who knows? But I mean, generally, I would say where we disagree is that we think that the profits are good right now, but it, the market cares about what profits are going to be. So, you know, we, we've had a pretty distinct view uh, for a while around this. And, you know, I think some of it's margin. Um, we think more of it's going to be more top line now because growth is going to disappoint and the risk of recession has gone up considerably. So I think to have confidence that, you know, the earnings growth that's being forecasted today will be achieved, um, I, I wouldn't have so much confidence in that. I mean, that's generally our, I think, our disagreement. I think earnings will disappoint over the next 12 months, maybe significantly, if it's a recession, obviously. Um, and that's where the risk in the stock market lies. And, you know, the argument on valuation, you know, look, I mean, rates are still 288, even though they're down quite a bit here. You know, the equity risk premium, we think, is still underpriced for a, a, you know, where we are in the growth cycle. And, and so you, you're not going to get relief on multiples. And if earnings come down, then it's a one for one. Lisa Shannon and Morgan Stanley, your colleague, earlier this week said the analysts at the moment are like deer in the headlights. They're just not cutting their estimates. When you look at the earnings estimates at the moment, Mike, is that true X energy? What kind of picture do you get if you strip out energy? Yeah, that's a good question, John. We've looked at this. Uh, we've, we've published on it, which basically, if you take energy and materials out, um, the forward end estimates have started to come down, but not significantly, not in a way like they should be. Um, I, I would say the companies are the ones in the headlights. I mean, you know, they, well, why are they not guiding lower? I mean, they should be seeing this, um, you know, from a macro top-down standpoint. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Uh, it was obvious that six months ago what was going to happen to margins and pricing pressure. And, of course, then the inventory, which surprised everybody, which seems like that was pretty obvious, too, that we were going to get too much inventory, which then leads to discounting. So we're just very early days in the revision factors coming down, um, you know, I don't, I don't know who's in the headlights, but the bottom line is the earnings numbers are wrong. Mike, I'm surprised that the corporations are surprised, and I'm surprised that other people are surprised that they're surprised. And I hope you manage <laughs> to keep up there. Because, Mike, when the retailers come out and they offer us weak guidance, we don't just get small moves in the equity market as if we've priced this already. We get massive gaps lower. And I want to understand, Mike, what's going on there just how well understood this is, how well priced this story is, and the pockets in the equity market where you think we haven't quite done enough work here, we haven't brought down expectations enough, and there's more price declines in our future. Well, John, that's what I always like about you. You always ask the right question, right? It was like, well, how could the stocks be surprised? I mean, because, you know, I think people uh, have been willing to get bullish too early in this, in this down cycle saying, well, it's all priced. But then, as you mentioned, a couple of large retailers you know, uh, came up with some surprisingly high inventory numbers and the stocks got absolutely smashed. 
meaning it wasn't in the stocks. So that's a wake-up call, right? I mean, it, what it means is that, you know, what you think that, you know, what might be in the price of the stock is probably not. And I would say, I would say what's in the price of the stocks right now is a, is a much tighter Fed, and the fact that they're fighting inflation and financial conditions are, are going to remain tight, okay? As you and I have discussed in the show before, I think the back end of the market, you know, is, is kind of priced that in fully. And so multiples have priced in the Fed. What the market has not priced in is the earnings disappointment whether that's because inventory's ballooned and there's discounting or because you know top line demand just falls out because unit growth isn't there. Uh, it's a combination of both. And we're getting more conviction, not less conviction, that these numbers are gonna have to come down by even more than we thought just six weeks ago. So Mike, your number 3,400, that's now the base case. Can you walk me through the recessionary scenarios too? Because the thing I keep hearing now, and we all hear a lot of it, is recession has slowly become the base case, but ultimately it's a shallow one. Is that your view too? Yeah, we're not quite to the base case being recession, but it's probably 40% chance. So it's, you know, it's pretty darn close. And uh, we would, at this point, we would say we think it'll be a, a mild recession in the sense that it's not going to have, you know, big financial contagion, big default cycle, banking system is in good shape. So, you know, we can, we can actually come out of it uh, fairly good in a good situation next year. But to say that it's been priced already, we think is misplaced. Okay, and that's where we spent a lot of time in our research the last three or four weeks because that's the question we're getting from clients is, okay, you know, we got to start thinking about a recession. Tell me where it's priced. And our analysis would strongly suggest that in a mild recessionary case, okay, not a you know stagflationary case, but a mild recessionary case, that you should probably trade close to three thousand on the S and P five hundred. Now, timing of that is going to be challenging. Um, I would say probably fourth quarter is as good a guess as any if if the recession becomes inevitable. OK, we don't know the answer to that. In the event that we don't have a recession and it's a softish landing where we can avoid a labor cycle, we think it's closer to thirty four hundred. Right. So you get a probability adjust that and you can then you know do your risk reward based on, on that downside risk. Now, in the middle of all that, John, of course, there's going to be individual stock opportunities and things to do which is our job as you know, strategists and investors is to, you know, everything doesn't bottom on the same day. And so, you know, our, our objective is to try and, and time this at the stock level as well as at the index level. Well, Mike, can we talk about that? And we'll finish there too. You started this year and we get to talk a lot and I'm grateful for that by de-emphasizing the index level story and emphasizing some single names. Can you re-emphasize those single names right now, Mike, and the pockets of risk you're willing to take, even with the risk that you've explained around the earnings story through the rest of this year? Yeah, so I mean, we've been uh, positioned defensively and then, you know, uh, with a barbell with uh, energy because those are your classic late cycle groups. Okay, so that's been working really well this year. Things like healthcare, things like REITs and utilities, even some of the staples up until recently have held up. But of course, now they're feeling inflationary pressure. So those, those types of stocks have been working well with energy. And then the other thing we've been really uh, looking at are companies that have high operational efficiency, meaning they can deliver you know, profits growth or profits and margin in a difficult operating environment. Okay, now here's where it gets interesting to us. All right, if it's, a, if it's an extension of the cycle, a soft landing, we're going to probably rotate back into things like technology, uh, industrials, probably even on more energy, maybe go back to materials again. However, in the recessionary outcome, you can't do that. You need to stay defensive all the way till the end, and then we'll flip it probably sometime later this year into what we call early cycle groups, things like banks, you know, semiconductors, uh, retailers, consumer cyclicals. We just think it's way premature to be making that trade now, right? Because you haven't priced the recession yet. That means those early cycle groups, it's just not time. And I think you'll remember back in, you know, March of 2020, when we made that flip, you know, we, we timed it well, fortunately in that instance, um, you know, people thought we were nuts, but that's exactly what you have to do in that recessionary outcome. All I can tell you, John, is that everything's happening faster this cycle yeah. than I've ever seen. It's going to, the conclusion to this chapter, okay, it's going to be either a recession or an extension of this expansion. It's going to be fast. And it's going to be, oh, we're going to know the answer probably by October. Mike, I think I've told you this before. I thought you were nuts too. But you turned out to be very <laughs> right. Mike Wilson, thank you. And Morgan Stanley. Mike, we appreciate it. Enjoy the long weekend, sir. We're positive just about on the S&P by a tenth of 1%, negative just about on the Nasdaq by a tenth of 1%. Coming up, President Biden looking for a helping hand with gasoline prices. All the Gulf states are meeting. I indicated to them that I thought they should be increasing oil production generically, not to the Saudis. The team coverage from Madrid, Spain, following the NATO meeting up next.
I would put down as sort of 4,000 would be a level, sort of a ceiling over the next several months. It would be difficult for equity prices to kind of pierce that level on the upside. Uh, and that would be the idea if the, that was to be happening. The Fed might have to be leaning harder into, uh, into forward guidance and things like that. The idea of looking out towards the end of the year, the sort of baseline scenario would be if the Fed has and inflation starts to recede in the fall, that would allow equity prices perhaps to move higher. Alternative scenario would be recession. And in a recessionary environment in a scenario, you're probably looking at a level of the market around 3,150. Uh, and the sort of transmission mechanism for how that happens would be a series of significant negative earnings revisions across the market, kind of looking into 2023. And that would take a consensus number right now around $250 for next year in profits. That would probably take that down closer to 200. Uh, and then that transmission mechanism as it sort of degrades, we talked about it in the, in the previous section, uh, that would probably lead to a multiple that goes a little bit lower. The idea of the equity market having derated from 21 times earnings to around 16 times or so now, 16 times forward earnings, that's been the total driver, the significant driver, higher rates, lower equity prices. We just haven't seen it on the earnings front. Goldman's David Costin, just awesome yesterday, talking about the potential for a cap on any potential rally right now on the equity market of about 4K at the moment, 3,800. Contributing to this morning's gains and rally in energy as well, the commodity and the equity. The president, for him, that's the elephant in the room, looking for the Gulf states to help tamp down surging prices. All the Gulf states are meeting. I indicated to them that I thought they should be increasing oil production generically, not to the, to the Saudis particularly. And I think we're going to, I hope we see them in their own interest concluding that makes sense to do. Let's get to the team, the Bloomberg team, Anna Madrid, Spain, Anne Marie, and Maria Tadeo. Maria and Anne Marie, fantastic work this week. Let's just put some concluding remarks on it. Maria, how much was the energy story the elephant in the room, whether it was Bavaria, Germany, or Madrid, Spain? It was the entire elephant in the room. I think it really, it, it really, that is the thing. When you look at what to me is a highlight of this very intense diplomatic week is Emmanuel Macron who goes running after President Biden, knowing full well there's a camera in front of him, and he tells him, hey, I spoke to the Saudis, like, perhaps you told me I should do, and they said it's full maximum capacity, so what can we do now? They're not going to do more. I think that that, to me, was a real takeaway. You don't say something like that if you don't want the cameras and send a political message uh, there. He also did the same to the Indians, by the way. He said, what about the cap? Would you agree with that? Of course, it didn't go anywhere, but it really shaped uh, the conversation, and I guess that was a real takeaway from it. They really want to turn off the revenue machine for Vladimir Putin. This is a real why the war is still ongoing in their view because it's able to pay for this war machine but they don't find the way to turn down their revenue and it's been an incredible year for energy if you're the russians right now so it is a tricky very tricky question and marie your thoughts Well, yesterday, really, when the president was asked from our colleague about, are you going, and this is going to be, everyone is going to be watching this meeting, right? When he steps off in Jeddah, how is his interaction going to be with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman? And he, the president tried to cage this trip, saying he's going to meet the GCC, all the Gulf partners. He's going to ask all the Gulf partners. But, Jonathan, you and I know not all the Gulf partners can help the president with $5 gasoline. There's two that have the spare capacity, and that's the United Arab Emirates and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And even if the president goes, and he will be going, and even if the Saudis acquiesce and they pump more, that will not solve $5 gasoline in America. But the issue for the president is, while the Saudis cannot fix the market alone, you cannot fix the oil market without the kingdom. To the two of you, fantastic BS. work this week. Just absolutely brilliant to both of you. Anne-Marie Hordern to Maria Tadeo as they go from Bavaria, Germany to Madrid, Spain, wrapping up the NATO summit and, of course, the G7 meeting earlier this week as well. From New York, your trading diary, up next.
Equity is just about positive. That's a turnaround. We're positive a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields lower, much lower. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. Here is the number one data point of the week for me. ISM manufacturing at the top of the hour. President Biden meeting with the U.S. governors at 1 Eastern next week. U.S. markets closing for Independence Day on Monday. The FOMC minutes on Wednesday. And finally, the main event on Friday, the payrolls report. Guy Johnson's going to pick it up in about four minutes and give you that ISM manufacturing number. Mike McKee will break that down. Kriti Gupta is going to give you an idea of just how bad travel is going to be this long weekend. From New York City, from me to you, try and enjoy your long weekend stateside. Thank you very much for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.